Good morning, everyone. It is 746, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We like to run on schedule at Camp War Eagle. This is Auburn 101, letting go while holding on. Uh, we will continue to have people come in and join us as they go through the breakfast line. Uh, before we get too far along, I want to give a special shout out to the seven or eight of you who joined us for the mandatory parent run this morning. Uh, clearly, we need to revisit the definition of mandatory. That's okay, though. Um, I am Tori Palmer. I'm the administrator of parent and family programs for Auburn University. And my office's job is to help you help your student. What you're learning at Camp War Eagle is that there are a lot of resources and services dedicated to helping your student while they're here with us for the next few years. Parent and family programs is your office to receive support and help while your student is here with us. Because as big of a transition as this is for your student, we know that it's going to be a big transition for you as well. We want to be sure that you know that it's okay to be involved. I am not going to be someone to shame you for being involved with your college age student's college experience, because the data are very clear. Students who have involved parents or families are more likely to be retained to year two. They are more likely to perform better. They are more likely to graduate in four years. Your involvement is a good thing and a thing that I absolutely support. We can absolutely talk about levels of involvement, sure, but the intent to help your student is a good thing and we want you to be a part of the process. And in our session today, we're going to talk about some expectations that we'd hope that we could set for you for this first semester and beyond, talk about some transition guidance as we navigate this first period of time, and then learn how parent and family programs can be helpful to you moving forward. Now, in addition to my role in working with all of you on campus, I also work with my colleagues because as much as we might prefer you all to call me instead of them, we know that you're going to reach out to offices and units. And so I help them better work with parents and families. And when I meet new friends on campus and I tell them I'm Tori Palmer, I work with Auburn students and their families, I will typically get the response of, why do you want to work with them? And them is said with some level of fear and hesitation. And I think the why is very easy. Almost every phone call, every email that I get, I am working with someone who wants to help their student be better, have a better experience, be a part of the Auburn family in a way that improves their situation. So it's really easy to want to work with all of you to help enhance that. But I do think that when I'm talking to them and I ask them, okay, why did you respond that way? Talk to me about that. Why are you so afraid of college parents? And I'll ask them, describe, if you would, when I say the phrase Auburn parent or any college parent, what are you thinking of? Tell me what you think. And because we believe in honesty and truthfulness at Auburn, I will share with you what they most often share with me, and they will give me the phrase helicopter parent. And if I ask them to describe the helicopter that they are thinking of in their heads, they will typically give me something that looks a little bit like this. It's an attack helicopter, <laughs> missiles blazing, ready to mow down any resistance in the path of their student. And when I'm talking with them about why they think this is, ultimately we arrive at the same conclusion. Those of us in this room and those of us who work at this institution, we have an entirely different frame of reference when it comes to looking at your students. You'll notice that we're even very intentional about referring to them as our students, not your children. We see young adults starting their academic journey here with us at the university, preparing and learning and getting ready to take on the next steps for what life looks like after Auburn. And it's not that as parents or families you don't see that a significant change has taken place and a transition, but you have an additional layer of context that we don't have. You have late nights when they were babies and they couldn't sleep, rocking them to bed. You have backyard birthday parties, sitting at the homework table, wondering why on earth do we have new math when old math worked just as fine. You have the first fender bender in high school, the first breakup, and recently you got to watch them walk across the stage and graduate from high school, closing that chapter on their lives in preparation for the start of this next one. 
And so we have a different way of looking at your student. And what I know in this session is that I am never going to be able to take away your pilot's license. If you're going to helicopter, you're going to helicopter, regardless of what I say. But what I hope that we can do during our time today is get us to begin to transition away from attack helicopters into life flight. Because if it is your concern that your student is never going to reach out or call or talk to you again once you bring them here, I'm going to encourage you and reassure you that they absolutely are. Because my role on campus is to help you help them. Because when they call and you make the referral and you share the resource with them, the number, the email address, the person that they can talk to, they are going to be more successful as a result. And really, right now, we're in the summer of transition. Some of these transitions are really big. Some of them are really small. And let's start with the small one first, laundry. We track every phone call and email that we get in my office. In one year at the winter holiday, we received a call from a very upset mom who wanted to let us know that there was not a functioning washer and dryer in her student's residence hall the entire semester. I'm a big believer in trusting but verifying when you call, and so I reached out to my friends in university housing and facilities management, and what we found was that there was, in fact, a functioning washer and dryer in that residence hall, but the student didn't know how to use it, and instead of asking an RA or calling back home to talk to mom or dad, he was going and buying new clothes every time he ran out of clean clothes. And so he came home with about 13 industrial-sized trash bags full of dirty clothes at the winter break. By the time we called mom back to let her know what had happened, the story had evolved. Some additional truths had come to light, and she knew that there was a functioning washer and dryer. And so pro tip for laundry, print out your instructions, laminate them, stick them to the bottom of their hamper, and then every time they go, they want to know what to do when it's time to wash their clothes. The other transition that's happening is we would hope that you'd start letting them make some everyday financial choices now. Because when they're here, every day they are not going to be running their financial choices through you. As a family, you have probably centralized a lot of this decision making. But when they're here with us in the fall, they will be able to come into this building and go to Starbucks on the second floor and spend $5 on a cup of coffee, or they can go on the ground floor to Aubon Pond and spend $3 on a cup of coffee. $2 once, not a big deal, but over weeks, over semesters, over a month, over a year, it's going to add up. It has been my experience in working with Auburn students that they have a different way of looking at money than those of us in this room do. <laughs> Help them to understand now the value of budgeting, of spending what they should and shouldn't, that when they run out of fun, free money, that it doesn't mean they should take out a credit card to get more fun, free money just because they can. Help them to start taking independence over a lot of these financial choices that you have probably been making on their behalf. Another transition, and this is the one that will typically cause the most whiplash for parents and families and their students, is how the communication has changed from this institution to you. If you think about your experiences in K through 12, if there was a teacher or a counselor or an administrator you wanted to talk to, you could always reach out to that person, schedule an appointment, and you would never have to have their permission or their consent to do it. And now, with very little ramp down on the level of responsibility you're used to having and very little ramp up to the level of responsibility that they now have, that dynamic has changed. My colleagues in the Office of the Registrar talked to you yesterday about one of the reasons why. Uh, we have to follow a different set of rules at this level, the big one being the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act of 1974. It's a federal law. It's not us trying to make your lives more difficult. And I appreciate that it is galling that many of us in the room are probably contributing significantly financially for your student to be here and by default, you are excluded from information. But I will share with you what I've shared with other angry parents and families about this dynamic in the past. 
I fear an angry federal government a lot more than I fear an angry you. So we're going to continue to follow the rules that we have to follow. My colleagues across campus are as well. But we are going to provide things like the family portal, which we'll talk about in a few slides, to give you more information. And we can always help you based off what you share with us. We just might not be able to confirm or deny that the version of events you're getting from your student is 100% accurate. And then the other transition, and this is one that we'll get calls about from moms and dads, is about safety. You have probably been keeping the guardrails up to help keep your student more safe. You have been doing things like curfews and mandatory check-ins and Life360. And I don't imagine for a second that Life360 is going away. You're going to be looking at that map constantly. Where are you? But one thing that we would hope that you would share with them when they're here is talk to them about what it means to be safe as an independent young adult because they are now primarily responsible for their safety. Talk with them about when they call you and they tell you that they were in the library till three in the morning working on a paper. That was not code for I was being a hooligan downtown. They were probably there. That when they're walking through campus that late at night, it's a bad idea to have both of their AirPods in, noise canceling turned on, oblivious to the world around them. That when they go for a run in town, they should lock their apartment doors behind them. That when AU alerts go off, they should heed the warning that's there. And they are going to roll their eyes at you, and they're going to scoff, and they're going to tell you that I've got this, we don't need to have this conversation. But I'm going to ask that you have it anyway, because we know that they listen. Before I was in this role, I was a counselor on campus, and when we would work with students who were trying to change majors or look at a different field for post-Auburn, and they were struggling with that decision, one of the things that they would almost always tell us is, I want the people back home to be okay with this choice that I'm making. I want them to understand. I want them to like it too. So even if they are presenting that they don't care about your opinion, or they give you a major eye roll when you tell them that yes, you have the right of way in the crosswalk, but in the direct head-to-head -head competition between you and a car, the car is going to win every time. Have the conversation anyway, because they're going to pay attention. And when we think of transitions, probably one of the biggest ones of all that's happening in just now, a month and a few days, is move in. And we have probably been thinking that this is going to go a certain way. It's going to be a beautiful 72 degrees outside. <laughs> be no humidity. There'll be a breeze blowing. You're going to have packed your car days, weeks in advance. No last minute additions. When you open the trunk, Architectural Digest will want to come and take pictures of just how immaculate it looks. And you're going to roll up to the curb of your student's residence hall or apartment complex. And they're going to get out of the car and they're going to look at you with love and adoration in their eyes. And they're going to say, Mom, Dad, today I am a great success. And I am the success because of you. <laughs> I love you so much. Don't go. No, that's, that's not how it's going to go at all. Regardless of what day you move in, it will be the hottest day in Alabama. Humidity will be off the charts. You will still roll up to the curb of your student's apartment complex or residence hall. That will stay the same. But you will have a great deal of fear to open the trunk and the impending avalanche of things that are going to fall out. And your student is still going to get out of the car. And they're going to look at you, probably not with love and adoration, but a look of utter contempt. And they're going to say, I cannot believe that you decided to wear that on today of all days. Because the reality is, it is much easier for them to pick a fight, to say something nasty, to be mean, than it is for them to look at you and tell you that they're going to miss you, that they are scared, that they don't know what this next step is going to bring. They are anxious, and they're going to they do, in fact, love you quite a bit, and that when it's time for you to go, they probably don't want you to go just yet. 
Because the reality of move-in is you are going to spend a lot of time in unair conditioned stairwells moving things up and then moving things down because you almost always overpack. You are going to rearrange that residence hall room 30 plus times knowing full well there's only three combinations that actually work. <laughs> and you are going to do this because you want them to have as strong of a start as possible. And our best advice for move-in is to not leave a mess and to bring a tough skin. Both not leave a mess in terms of our campus and our community, it's beautiful, help us keep it that way, but also don't leave a mess with them. Because at the end of move-in, you get to go home. They have to stay here with us. Uh, we got a call one move-in, and it was one of those blistering, hot, humid Alabama days. It was from a dad, and he just had the tone of someone who needed help. He just got the call and something wasn't right. So I'm talking with dad. He says, Tori, we need you over here in the quad right now. We've got a big issue. And I like to know what I'm walking into before I walk into it. So I said, all right, can you share with me what's going on? He said, yeah, we're here. We're moving in. And you're not going to believe this, but my student's roommate, he likes country music. <laughs> you know what they say about people who like country music. No idea. To this day, I have no idea what he meant by that. But I could tell that dad was really concerned. He needed help. So I walked over to the quad. We're talking with him. And what I can see in the room is that, yes, these were two young men who were never going to share a playlist on Spotify. <laughs> Not in the cards. But I could also see two young men who were making the most out of what was a new and different situation for them. They had done potluck roommate assignment. This was the first time they were meeting each other. And they were figuring it out. They were well on their way to talking about what they were going to do once their parents had left. They were already conspiring for how they were going to rearrange the room once the moms had left. <laughs> they were making the most out of what was a challenging and stressful situation for them. And so I'm going to ask you not to leave a mess because your students are paying attention. They are going to see that dad is very concerned that he likes country music. Maybe I should be concerned too. Or mom doesn't like any of this. She is really stressed. She is very upset. Maybe I need to be stressed and upset too. If mom's not happy, there must be something going on here. They are paying attention. And so I'll move in as hard as it might be. I'm going to ask that you not leave a mess, even if they say something that's mean or nasty. It's not that they're wanting to hurt your feelings. They're just going through a lot as well. And before we move them in, we're going to ask that you set some expectations with them. And let's talk about the one that causes the most frustration between parents and families, at least at first, and that's grades. When we think of this, we get a lot of calls at the winter holiday because grades get posted then. And you want to talk to me about what happened. And one year at winter break, we got a call from a mom who was talking to me about how disappointed she was in her student. Because to listen to mom was their first semester, college was going to be a chance to restart. High school was rough. This was going to be our new opportunity to start over and really just start strong. So I asked, would you mind sharing with me what your student's GPA was? And she said, sure. He had a 299 that first semester, which isn't a terrible GPA. That's C's, B's, maybe an A if they took enough credit hours. And when we were talking, I said, all right, would you share with me their high school GPA right as they graduated? She said, sure. It was a 3.2. And so if it is your expectation that your student is going to improve remarkably at their peak performance from high school to their first semester here at the university, I'm going to encourage you to reevaluate that. Because we are about to change everything they know about an academic setting. We're going to change how their faculty lecture. We're going to change how many people are in the room with them. We're going to change the type of work and projects that they do. And in addition to all the academic changes, we're going to change everything else as well. We're going to change where they're sleeping at night, who they're hanging out with, when and how they're getting their meals, how late they're out, what they're doing through the day. And all of these changes are going to have an effect on them while they're here. So as we're building expectations for the first semester and beyond, I'd ask that you include some grace in that. Because the good news for all of us in the room right now 
is all of you are the parents of an Auburn student with a 4.0 GPA. Congratulations. <laughs> but come winter, a lot of us will not be able to lay claim to that. The other expectation we want you to set with them are about finances, and not the everyday ones we were talking about earlier, but the big ones. Namely, how much and how long you can contribute to them being here at the university. I would encourage you not to have the conversation that my dad had with me before I came to Auburn a long time ago. He said, looked at me at the table and said, Tori, your mother and I, we have money. We're going to be okay. You, on the other hand, you have nothing. <laughs> the end. He wasn't wrong. But what I would say is that it is very hard to expect your student to be a good steward of the financial investment that you're making in them if they don't understand what that financial investment looks like. I'm not saying that you have to give them your online banking username and password, but they should understand what it looks like for, as a family, for them to be here to have this all an experience. They do not need to be surprised by changes in finances. Changes in finance are some of the biggest uh, changes that will affect a student while they're here with us. Not only does it affect their ability to pay for tuition, but it affects their housing, their food, and everything else. If you have only managed or are only willing to support them for four years, and for whatever reason they get to that, they need that fifth year, we do not need them surprised by a sudden change in the help and level of support that they have come to rely on. I appreciate that it's a difficult conversation, but we're going to ask you to have it anyway. Now, I know that these are not necessarily fun conversations, and you might want a guide. So on page 145 of your Tiger Transitions, there's a college contract that we would ask that you sit down and talk with them about. In an increasingly digital world, there's something really nice about being able to sit down, write on a sheet of paper, everyone sign their names to this, these expectations, and then revisit it how we did at the end of each semester. And I'd encourage you to do this for every semester that they're here with us. And so we're going to move them in, we're going to set some expectations, and then we're going to get to the first week. And this is where we give our first of two hard pieces of advice. Is that the first one is, when you bring them here, we're going to ask that you leave them here, and you go home as well. And right now, you might be thinking, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. It hurts my feelings how much they want to get out of my house and come here. Can I bring them tomorrow? But what you're going to see is the closer we get to move in, there's a significant break between some move in dates and when the first day of term is. And the temptation to have one more family vacation, to come home for one more weekend, will get stronger and stronger. And I'm going to ask that you not do it. Because those first period of time as they move in and beyond is really important for them to have their footing under them. My colleagues in involvement will talk to you about the first 56, which is our welcome week equivalent, but we know that students need more than a week to get acclimated to campus, so we provide them 56 days of it. When we think of that first week, they will never be able to find their place here if they are constantly running back to you or if you're right there with them. When we had a call on the 15th class day, few years ago. It was from a mom, and she wanted to talk to me about withdrawal. The 15th class day is important. It's the last day you can withdraw and get tuition refunds. And so she was talking to me, and she let me know, we've tried this Auburn thing. We just don't think it's for us. We've been going to some club meetings. The classes are really interesting. We love going to downtown dinner. It's lovely, beautiful community, but it's just not working out. And if you're clever, you notice that mom was using a really peculiar set of pronouns. We, us, our. And so next question is, I said, ma'am, would you mind sharing with me where you are right now? And she said, sure. And without skipping a beat or any shame in her voice, she said, I'm in my daughter's dorm room. I've been staying with her the first few weeks to help her get acclimated to campus. <laughs> so the conversation changes dramatically at that point. But of course, that student wasn't finding community or finding home here when her mom was with her every step of the day. We also don't want you to be, as one student had his dad come to the Welcome Week grave, dancing on the front row, right up here. You don't want your student to be remembered as, oh gosh, that was your dad, wasn't it? 
because it is hard to say goodbye. It is hard to see them start spreading their wings, but it is very important that they have the opportunity to do so. And in that first week and beyond, we're gonna ask that you be our partners with saying, after every conversation you have with them, I love you, go to class. <laughs> there is a surprisingly statistical correlation between class attendance and class performance. The more they go, the better they are likely to do. Groundbreaking, I know. And this will, for many of them, be the first time that they have the active choice of not going to class. A lot of our faculty don't have attendance policies. They have provided the opportunity to learn. It is up to your student to take advantage of that. In that first week when you do this, they're going to think that you have you know, gone off the deep end. Of course, I'm going to class. Why wouldn't I be going to class? That's the first week. But by the third week, fourth week, We'll have a, that first 8 a.m. when it's raining. Maybe they were up too late the night before studying. And they're going to be like, oh, I really don't want to go. But I talked to mom, and she told me to go to class, so I'm going to go. And then by the time they make it to midterms and they see all of their friends who have not been going as regularly as they have, they're going to see that, thank gosh, they told me to go to class because it does make a difference. So every call, I love you, precious angel go to class. We also want you to participate in our traditions. You are part of our Auburn family as well now. Welcome. So we want you to roll our trees after every sporting victory. We want you to wear all of the Auburn orange and blue that you possibly can. And I know that I've just said two traditions, but in a room this big, there's someone who's now very uncomfortable. This man on this stage just told you to roll his trees and to wear orange and blue. And you're a big fan of the other school in this state you are sitting in the heart of the great enemy. So the good news that I have for you is that us and the other school, we share a common collegiate sporting color, the color white. So you can wear all the white polos, all the white hats that you possibly could care for. We don't want to see any big G's, power T's, or script A's. I was really nice. I called it a script A. I could have called it a mullet A, but I didn't. It's a script A. We're kind here. And I want you to do this because participating in traditions is an easy way to show buy-in. Your student is paying attention. They know that this probably would not have been the choice that you would have made. And when so much of what we say is not what comes out of our mouths, but what we do, you can show them that you support them in this endeavor. So get to our football games early to see the eagle fly. Encourage them not to step on the seal. They are learning about all the terrible things that will happen to them if they do. The one you all should care about is they won't graduate in four years. And when you don't know what else to say, say War Eagle. War Eagle is one of the most versatile phrases in all of English. If aloha is hello and goodbye, War Eagle is everything else. We had a student who worked in our office one year who was preparing for medical school and he had just gone through the MCAT process and he was really stressing about his score. He came in one Monday morning and he said, guys, I did it. This is exactly what I needed. I'm gonna be competitive for my top choices. War Eagle, exclamation point. Same student, a couple of weeks later, we knew that he was getting ready to ask someone to his fraternity formal. And we were talking with him one Monday morning and he let us know, yeah, I finally did it. I'm proud of myself for doing that. However, she said, no, war eagle. <laughs> and so the call's coming, and they're going to tell you, you're never going to believe this. I made an 89 on that test I was telling you about. And you're not going to remember, okay, is this the class that you had to have a 90 on to pass? Or is this the class that you just had to have a 37 to graduate? And if you give them a solid, war eagle, honey, they're going to interpret that exactly the way that they wanted, and you will be the hero in that scenario. And so some best practices, always give your student notice before you visit campus. This is especially important if you have a weak stomach or a heart condition. You do not want to catch them in the wild. This is also especially important for your homesick student. You might think that by surprising them, they will be happy to see you, and they will. But it is better for that homesick student that you tell them a future date that you are coming so they can look forward to that visit. 
They can stop worrying about how much they miss you right now and want to see you and start trying to find community on campus. Always end every conversation with go to class. Always use War Eagle when you don't know what else to say. And always remember the phrase, how are you going to handle that? I told you I give two hard pieces of advice. This is the hardest piece. It is not easy to see people you love struggle, to see them be in a mess, to see them be in a situation that you know you could fix and take away that stress and that anxiety from them. But I'm gonna ask you to let them sit in their messes, to let them be stressed, and to let them figure out how to resolve the situation. And I appreciate that a lot of the situations they will find themselves on this campus could have an effect on the outcome of their Auburn experience. College is a bizarre value proposition. Many of us in this room are spending a lot of money expecting a certain outcome. And as anyone who's expending a lot of money, you probably want to do everything that you can to have that outcome be a good one. But what I will say is that there is not a problem that your students find themselves in on campus that you can actually resolve for them. It has to be them. And that is very easy for me to say, as someone who doesn't have a college age child, who in fact has no children, it's a lovely life choice, I love it for me. <laughs> but what I do have is I have people that I love, and I have people that I care about, and I can see them be in situations where I know I could probably fix this. I can make it better. But if I do it, I also know that they are never going to learn how to do it themselves next time. And the good thing about this phrase is you can use it in any scenario. Mom, my roommate pawned my Xbox. War Eagle. How are you going to handle that? My roommate wore my brand new blouse and spilled something all over it. Oh gosh, War Eagle baby. How are you gonna handle that? Mom, I told you that I was really struggling in physics and we got our second test back and I'm still struggling. I did not do what I needed to do. I'm sorry to hear that. How are you gonna handle that? And I think what you will find is that they do know how to fix the scenarios that they find themselves in. They are often calling to vent, to share frustrations, to be upset because you're one of the few people that they trust to share that experience with. And they are wanting and hoping maybe that you will volunteer to take it off their plate. But the reality is they are probably just wanting to complain, to be frustrated, and to talk to someone that they trust to share that with. So how are you going to handle that? Will get easier to say with time, but it is one of the most powerful tools in your arsenal. And when they call, and they're gonna call with all kinds of questions that you're not gonna talk or know how to refer them to, that's where I think parent and family programs can be helpful. We are here to help you navigate all of the questions. You have been drinking from the fire hose of Camp War Eagle for the past two days, and you're not gonna know every referral every time. And that's where I can be helpful, because in many ways, we are Google for parents. We want you to reach out. I expect you to reach out to me. We also provide things like the Parent and Family Association, which lets you meet with other parents and families from your similar shared experiences, because we know that families from Florida have a different experience than those of California or Maine or downtown Birmingham. We want you to join the Family Portal to get access to information about your student you will be able to start making the request to connect to them this Saturday once they register for classes on Friday. There is information in there about holds on their account, midterm and final grades, financial information, timely dates and reminders. You can join at any time and we will be inviting you all to join after Camp War Eagle, but you just won't be able to connect to them to get your students information until the day after they register. But ultimately, we want you to trust your gut. You know this person far better than any of us who work here ever will. I think a lot about the dad who called me at the end of the year last year, and he was very upset. He told me very directly 
that at Camp Four Eagle, you told us that there was a lot of help available for my student. No one checked on him. No one reached out to make sure he was doing okay. And I'm really upset about that. He did not get any help. And he wasn't wrong. Make no mistake, this is a large public research institution with over 31,000 students. We do not have the ability to individually check on each of your students multiple times a year. We don't have the capacity. And there is a lot of help available to Auburn students, but we need them to ask for it when they need it. Referring your student and encouraging them to seek help is one of the best things that you can do for them. Because for many of them, this will be the first time that they've had to ask for it. We expect them to, we want them to, and we look forward to helping them. But they have to ask, have to ask us for it. And so, when you don't know who to call, call me. This is my direct line. If you call this number, I'll be the one to answer. This is my email address. If you want it in writing, send it there. I feel very good about my ability to get back to you within 24 business hours of you getting in touch with me. I currently manage about 38,000 parents. We just graduated 5,000 students in the spring, so I've got room on my call sheet for you. Reach out. We also have social media, and I will say really quickly about Facebook. I am aware of your private parent Facebook groups. I'm aware of them because I'm also a member of them. They're not so private, are they? I can see what you're saying. Some of it's really good. A lot of it's really bad. And so before we pile on the rumor train, the hill has exploded, there's black mold everywhere. And before you say, yeah, I heard that too, I hope that you remember the guy at camp who told you you could call him and talk to him and get information about whatever you need. Because I know that if I can help you, help your student, they will be more successful as a result. I'm glad that you're here. I look forward to working with you over the next four, five, six years or so. War Eagle. And we'll see you in the fall.